morning. I'm Jim Gardner, and I'm uh, pleased to be here this morning uh, on behalf of the Archivist of the United States, David Ferriero. Um, and um, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, the Nixon Legacy Forums back to the National Archives and to welcome you here uh, this morning. This will be the 22nd of these Legacy Forums. The most recent was only two weeks ago at the Gilchrist Museum of the University of Tulsa. That forum examined President Nixon's pivotal role in returning for sovereignty to American Indian tribes and ending two centuries of what the president in a message to Congress in July 1970 called, quote, ineffective and demeaning, end quote, federal policies. And that Tulsa forum was a first because it, com it comprised two separate panels, one of administration officials and the other of Indian leaders and the solicitor of the Interior Department, the purpose of which was to survey developments since Nixon's time. In November, uh, we will be co-sponsoring another forum on the Nixon administration's Indian policy uh, with our neighbors across the mall uh, at the Smithsonian's National Museum of the American Indian. The Nixon Legacy Forums is a perfect pairing of the National Archives, where we have the documents, the papers, the tapes, and the artifacts, and the Richard Nixon Foundation, which has the people who created and generated and implemented them. The videos and transcripts of these forums and the papers and tapes and other materials that will complement and supplement them will be available at the library in Yorba Linda and eventually all around the world online. They will truly be a unique resource for citizens and scholars seeking to know about the Nixon administration. At the end of this month, at the library in Yorba Linda, we will be releasing the latest group of presidential documents. The most substantial segment of this group will be the files of the First Lady's press office, representing some 67 linear feet, which, take my word for it, translates into a lot of space. Um, this is particularly fitting because since March 16th, which was Pat Nixon's 100th birthday, the library has pre been presenting a terrific new exhibit, Pat Nixon, People Were Her Project. And in the public vaults here at the National Archives, we also have um, a tribute to, uh, Pat Nixon, uh, to Pat Nixon's centennial. And next year, uh, there will be a new Richard Nixon uh, exhibit in Yorba Linda to mark the 37th president's 100th birthday on, June, on January 9th, 2013. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Shepard, who will be moderating this morning's forum <coughs> on Nixon's recruits, the pre professionalization of executive appointments. I have an introduction here. You just have to well, you here, wait. Go, sh go short. <laughs> uh, Jeff is an alumnus of President Nixon's alma mater, Whittier College, and of Harvard Law School. Uh, he came to Washington in 1969 as a White House fellow assigned to the Department of the Treasury. In 1970, he joined the White House staff as a member of John Ehrlichman's uh, domestic council. And from 1972 to 1975, he was the council's associate director for general government. Uh, recently retired, um, he was an attorney in the insurance industry for over three decades. Now he is an author and the coordinator for the Nixon Foundation of the Nixon Legacy Forums. Um, thanks again for being with us uh, here this morning, and here's Jeff Shepard. Jim, thank you very much. And our panel is going to come out. As Jim has said, this is our 22nd Legacy Forum on Policy Initiatives of the Nixon Administration. They're co-sponsored by the National Archives and by the Richard Nixon Foundation. It's been a very wonderful and productive partnership, and we look forward to continuing it in the months and years ahead. This morning's forum is Nixon's Recruits, the Professionalization of Executive Appointments. It's a fact that over the decades that have passed since President Nixon left office, Significant numbers of men and women who later came to prominence in government came to Washington to serve in his administration. How and why that phenomenon came about 
and I think the numbers are sufficient to qualify it as a phenomenon, will be the subject of today's discussion. Let me introduce today's panelists. You already have some background, but I think we should add a little bit more. Alan Kopanen, we have a picture of Alan when he was a young man just yesterday, uh, joined the personnel office in June of 1969, and except for a stint at the re-election campaign, he stayed there throughout the Nixon administration. It makes him the longest serving member of the personnel office on this panel. His job might be, be described as political clearance, being satisfied that the people under consideration for appointments really were Republicans and had helped President Nixon win his election in the first place. Sitting next to Alan is Fred Malik, also a young man in those days. Fred is your classic executive, a West Point graduate and a Vietnam veteran. He ran his own business in South Carolina before joining the Nixon administration in 1969 as Deputy Undersecretary at HEW, the most senior management position in that huge department. He was brought over to the White House in 1970 to head the personnel office. Our primary focus today is on the changes that he helped to bring about when he made that move from Independence Avenue to Pennsylvania Avenue. Fred moved on in 1973 to take over the largest management job in the executive branch, Deputy Director for Management at OMB. Returning to the private sector, he formed his own financial firm, Thayer Capital Partners. Now that's been his day job. But he's also the most successful Republican fundraiser of all time working either for the Republican National Committee or G various GOP campaigns or governors. Now let me assure you, Fred has a golden Rolodex, and calls from Fred can be quite productive. Barbara Franklin, our next individual, we have Barbara pictured with President uh, Nixon, uh, joined, the, uh, joined the personnel office in 1971 to do what we call targeted outreach. Barbara's specific assignment was to bring more women into high-level positions in the government and she succeeded beyond our wildest dreams. She then went on to become the Secretary of Commerce in the cabinet of President George H.W. Bush. Jerry Jones, whose wife neglected to send us a picture, uh, uh, is another entrepreneur. He also joined the Malik staff in 1971 and then succeeded Fred when he moved to OMB. I learned only recently that uh, they shared a common heritage before that. They were section mates at uh, Harvard Business School and had worked together at McKenzie's office in uh, Los Angeles. Uh, as I say, Jerry succeeded Fred as head of the personnel office when Fred moved on. Jerry then went on to become staff secretary to Al Haig uh, in the Nixon administration, a position he held into the Ford administration, and then he became deputy assistant for scheduling in advance. I should point out that Jerry and Alan returned to the government in 2001 to help Donald Rumsfeld staff the Department of Defense uh, when Rumsfeld became Secretary of Defense. Penn James, we have a picture of Penn, is a professional recruiter, a classic headhunter. One of Fred Malik's first moves when he took over the office was to convince major headhunting firms to lend him some of their best talent, just for a six-week stint, according to Fred, to get a handle on real recruiting. Penn was loaned from the firm of Heydrich and Struggles, and Fred liked him so much he convinced Penn to join his staff permanently. Peter, P, uh, uh, Penn later left government and founded his own executive recruiting firm. We've asked Penn to speak last because he returned to Washington with the Reagan administration to run the personnel function during the 1980 transition and then to supervise the administration's staffing during its first 18 months in office. <coughs> Excuse me, Penn, Penn is going to talk about what changed and the lessons learned from the Nixon administration. So you can see we have full representation from the White House Personnel Office. The one person who wasn't able to be with us this morning is Peter Flanagan, one of Richard Nixon's oldest friends and advisors who staffed President Nixon during the transition in 1968 and stayed on in the early months of the Nixon administration to do personnel. He wasn't able to join us, but we talked at length last week, and I think I'll be able to present uh, his point of view. As, you see from the, as you'll see from the discussion that unfolds, the professionalization of the recruitment process may be seen as a part of the various organizational and structural changes that originated with the Nixon administration 
and that now form the basis for the modern presidency. In essence, it was a move away from what was known as cabinet government, where the president picked the cabinet, the cabinet picked their staff for their departments and ran their departments, to a centralized process of, of policy and of personnel to the president's own governing function into the executive office of the president. That's the innovation President Nixon introduced, and that's pretty much how the executive branch has been run ever since. Remember, for example, the Nixon administration centralized the policy-making process into the White House. The revitalization of the National Security Council under Henry Kissinger meant the president was running foreign affairs. The creation of the Domestic Council under John Ehrlichman meant the president was making the major domestic uh, uh, policy decisions. And the creation of the Office of Management and Budget from the old Bureau of the Budget centralized into the White House not just the management function, but also the central clearance of all regulations and the approval of all testimony rendered before Congress on behalf of the executive branch. So that was an innovation that occurred in policy making under the Nixon administration. We're going to see in a moment there was a parallel change in personnel under, uh, also under that administration. Let's begin with the big picture. The presidency functions at its highest as an agent of change. Presidents run for office promising to cause change, and those that succeed are classified as among our most successful presidents. It's relatively easy, in retrospect, to promise change when you're running for president. But after a president has been elected, he, and soon she, needs to figure out how to effectuate that change. And there's two ways to do it, through structural reorganization of the sort I've already mentioned, and through personnel. Through people the president attracts to Washington, men and women, to help them to lead the executive branch. There's a confirmation process in the United States Senate, but it's generally conceded that a new president ought to get to name <coughs> his own people. How many people does he get to appoint and to what positions? There's no doubt about that. It's all nicely set out <coughs> in what's called the plum book. This is officially known as the list of United States policy and supporting positions. It's published once every four years by the United States Congress. It lists by name and by salary every political position of the outgoing administration. And in case you're wondering, yes, it really does have a plum colored cover. In 1968, the list that M President Nixon received identified over 5,000 positions, 555 of which were confirmable by the Senate. The 5,000 included 19 cabinet level positions, that's 12 departments that existed at that time, and seven positions, seven cabinet level positions, for the president to use as he saw fit. Some 450 members of the White House staff, about 2,500 Schedule C positions. Those are positions that are uh, uh, non-competitive because of the sensitive nature or the confidentiality required. These are positions the president gets to make. About 150 agency heads, including boards and commissions, just over 100 ambassadors, U.S. ambassadors to foreign countries, some 94 United States attorneys spread throughout the federal courts, and some 2,000 appointments to part-time boards and commissions. President Nixon's challenge as he came into office was that many people from the Eisenhower administration, which served from 1952 to 1960, had been older when they were in government, which was the standard at the time. By the time President Nixon was elected, there were only a handful of Eisenhower alumni willing or able to be constructed to, to come back to government. And primarily, this was Bill Rogers and Maury Stans and Bryce Harlow. But other than that, President Nixon and his people had to start from scratch. It was the first administration, excuse me, it was the first administration that purposely brought so many young people, young staffers, and I mean really young staffers in their 20s and 30s and 40s, to serve in the departments 
and on the Nixon White House staff itself. I'm going to skip through Peter for a second. Nope, I don't have a slide. We had a picture, which we don't have up, of a magazine article that showed 10 or 12 of the young people who were on President Nixon's early White House staff. And it was, I mean, I was, I was 24. I don't hold the record. There was uh, Larry Higby, who was Bob Haldeman's uh, uh, personal aide, was 22 when he, when he joined the White House staff. But let me recount now, because now we go to Peter's picture. There we are. Uh, let me recount what Peter told me last week about those early days in the Nixon administration. As he remembers, he was called by the president-elect the morning after President Nixon's 1968 election victory and asked to do two things. He was asked to find space in New York City for the transition, and he was asked for the first time to help the cabinet officers to staff their departments. Peter found two floors at the Hotel Pierre in New York, and they took space right up the street at the uh, uh, Willard Hotel for uh, staff here. Nixon said he wanted to pick his own cabinet, but that Peter's job was to help the cabinet officers to staff out their departments. For each cabinet officer, Peter and his staff, and his staff were Martin and Annalise Anderson, uh, uh, Bill Casey, and Cal Knudsen, they prepared three ring binders that contained a list of the open positions classified by department and promising resumes for the secretary's consideration to appoint to those positions. It was a huge undertaking, but they completed it by the time the president was inaugurated in January of 1969. At that point, Peter was then asked to stay for another six weeks because the personnel function wasn't quite complete. And, and, and uh, uh, he, he stayed, but his job gradually evolved into becoming an economic advisor to the president and concentrating on international affairs and on uh, uh, trade and tariffs. I asked Peter last week what sort of feedback he got from the cabinet secretaries on the jobs that they had listed and given them on these three ring binders about what they were doing. And Peter said those decisions were theirs alone and that uh, uh, reporting back on what they did was not a part of Peter's responsibilities. I, as I've said, this is a classic example of cabinet government, which was the model for the executive branch when Nixon took office. The president picked the cabinet, the cabinet staffed and ran their own departments. Let's look at President Nixon's first cabinet, which was named all at one time. Many people believe it was the strongest cabinet of any recent president, and this is an informal shot, hard for you to pick out the, 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 uh, the heads on the individual shot, but they're seated in the cabinet room of the West Wing, and the way the cabinet room is, is set up the president sits in the center on one side, the vice president sits opposite him, and then flanking out in both directions are the cabinet departments by order of when they were created. So right next to the president and vice president are state, justice, <coughs> treasury, and defense, and then beyond that you go by when the, when the uh, particular department was created. William Rogers, Eisenhower's attorney general, was at the Department of State. David Kennedy, a Chicago banker at Treasury, Congressman Mel Laird at Defense, the President's law partner and campaign director John Mitchell at Justice, Alabama businessman Winton Red Blunt at the Post Office, Alaska Governor Walter Hickel at Interior, Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Clifford Hardin at Agriculture, former director of the Bureau of the Budget and Nixon's campaign finance chairman Maury Stans at Commerce, University of Chicago Business School Dean George Schultz at Labor, California Lieutenant Governor Robert, Robert Finch at HEW, Michigan Governor George Romney at HUD, Massachusetts Governor John Volpe at Transportation. Those were the 12 existing cabinet departments. But in addition, Henry Kissinger was to run the National Security Council. Nixon's two White House counselors were Arthur Burns and Daniel Patrick Moynihan. And Don Rumsfeld was to run the Office of uh, Economic Opportunity the Office of Economic Opportunity. The president announced his entire cabinet at one time in a nationally televised event, and we have a film clip from that that is going to come up. This is a special report from NBC News. President-elect Richard M. Nixon names his cabinet. Here is NBC News correspondent Edwin Newman. Good evening. 
At this moment, the 12 men who will head the major executive departments of the United States government for the next four years are in the Palladian Room of the Shoreham Hotel in Washington. President-elect Richard Nixon is scheduled to appear shortly to identify those 12 men, in short, to name his cabinet. Within the next half hour, we will see the shape of the forthcoming Nixon administration. And now at the outset, I wish to express appreciation to the radio and television networks for providing this opportunity for the first time in history for millions of Americans to be present, in effect, as a president-elect names the members of his cabinet. In introducing the members of the cabinet to you tonight, I'm not going to go through the usual procedure of giving the biographical material, where they were born, uh, where they went to school, how many children they have, and the like. Uh, you can read that in your morning papers or in Who's Who. What I am going to do, however, is to share with you this evening some of the concerns that went through my mind as I made this tremendously important decision with regard to the cabinet. Because as I had to decide the men who are to lead this nation in the next four years, considerations beyond what their academic records happen to be or their records in business, professional life, or in government, all of those considerations were important. But in selecting men for the highest positions in government, there has to be an extra dimension, an extra dimension which is the difference between good leadership and superior or even great leadership. President Nixon then goes on at that, at that event to walk you through each cabinet officer and uh, why, why he chose them. Uh, and I happened to watch it. I was in law school, and I, and I happened to watch it live. And, and one of the intriguing things to me is he skips Maury Stans, one of his very best friends, and he just thinks he's covered him. And Stans, you can see it in his face. He's trying to decide whether to raise his hand and say, you skipped me, and, and he chooses not to, and the president goes on. But what's so intriguing about President Nixon, and, and, and one of his greatest strengths, in, in, in that video clip, there's no teleprompter. He's not looking down at notes like I am. <laughs> President Nixon is winging it. And it, it, was, it was one of the incredible strengths of, the, of that individual. He could stand up and he could give a 45-minute speech without notes. And, and in that era, when you, when you didn't have teleprompting, when you couldn't do that, uh, uh, on the, under the glare of cameras, where, where you, you really shouldn't make a mistake, it was an incredible performance. Those selections of that original cabinet, along with others who came afterwards, uh, uh, read like a leadership directory for subsequent administrations. We kind of put together a list of other names that you should recognize. John Connolly, Bill Simon, and Paul Volcker at Treasury, William Rehnquist and Antonio Scalia at Justice, Earl Butts at Agriculture, Peter Peterson and Fred Dent at Commerce, Elliot Richardson, Leon Panetta, and Cap Weinberger at HEW, Jim Lynn at uh, HUD, George H.W. Bush as UN Ambassador, James Baker as RNC Finance Chairman, Pat Buchanan, uh, Elizabeth Hanson Dole, Hanford Dole, Barbara Franklin, David Gergen, Alan Greenspan, Virginia Nauer, Tom Korologos, and his now wife, Anne McLaughlin Korologos, all from the White House staff, John Bolton on the Vice President's staff, Al Haig, John Lehman, and Brent Scowcroft on the NSC, Lou Engman and Henry Paulson, uh, Hank was, was a kid just like I was on the Domestic Council, uh, uh, Roy Ash, Fred Malik, Paul O'Neill, Don Rice, Jim Schlesinger at OMB, Frank Carlucci and uh, uh, Dick Cheney at OEO, Helen Bentley at the Federal Maritime Commission, Ken Duberstein at GSA, and Bill Ruckel's house at EPA. Many people in the media found their, their beginnings in the Nixon administration. Uh, Roger Ailes, Brian Lamb, Bill Kristol, John McLaughlin, Diane Sawyer, and Ben Stein were all young people that, John McLaughlin wasn't that young, were all young people there on Nixon's staff. At one point, the heads of 19 different trade associations came from the Nixon staff here in Washington. And in addition to that, there were uh, executive officers and members of the boards of directors of hundreds of Fortune 1000 companies. All these people and numerous others originally came to Washington or came to prominence in Washington during the Nixon administration. It was an exciting time. Our panelists today helped appoint those very special teams. Campaigning changes. 
campaigning evolves. Each campaign seems to bring new approaches and new innovations. But the challenges of actually governing, of administering departments and running agencies does not change. Put simply, there are relatively few people who excel at the art of governing in politically appointed positions. And Richard Nixon seems to have attracted an inordinate number of them to his administration. With that, I will sit down and we will hear from our panelists who did this, starting with Alan Kompany. strong role they have played in making the Nixon legacy forums a success. I believe that the future historians will be giving thanks to you for not only providing all the papers that Richard Nixon has, but also having panels where people who actually did this work at that time, uh, to have that personal touch, uh, I think will be an important thing in 50 years and 100 years from now. I want to thank somebody else also, and that's you, Jeff because uh, Jeff has uh, been the leader who has uh, helped cause 22 of these forums to take place. It's been an enormous amount of work. He's uh, quite a leader when it comes to getting one of these together. So you're working on the Nixon legacy, but I think that in this process, Jeff, you've also added uh, something to the already uh, outstanding legacy that you personally have had. Uh, I want to start out by uh, talking about uh, President Richard Nixon and his relationship to the personnel office. And the per first and most poignant uh, meeting he had with the people in the White House personnel office was early in the administration where he told about what he expected as far as the people that he wanted to serve in his administration. Now you just saw what he said on TV and it was much the same that this group should go out and find the most competent person for every single position in this administration. And most importantly, he added on to that sentence, without regard to politics. So he was oriented toward finding the best people, and that was, that was the aim. Now, leadership is... Uh, is, is projected in many ways. And in, in the case of President Nixon, he not only gave us a direction as to what he expected the White House Personnel Office to do, but remember, you just heard Jeff go through the cabinet that was appointed by Richard Nixon, announced as a group. Now, I was been interested in politics and government since I was about 14 years old, seriously. And I have watched the cabinet, some of the cabinets before Richard Nixon's cabinet, and I've really watched all of them since. And I believe that the Richard Nixon cabinet, the, the people who, who were in that cabinet, that that was the most talented single cabinet ever put together uh, to this day. Uh, I was glad Jeff also told about the number of people who were the young people in the Nixon administration and where they continued to make a contribution to our government uh, through all these years. Uh, I wanted to uh, uh, talk a little bit about what it was like to be there. Uh, first, uh, where, where were we, the White House personnel operation? Well, you all know it was called the old Executive Office Building then. Now it's called the Eisenhower Executive Office Building. As you walked up those steps and saw that beautiful building and were cleared by the Uniformed Secret Service, you took a right, all those offices right across that first floor on Pennsylvania Avenue, plus down 17th Street, plus the offices across from that were the White House personnel's offices. That's important because there is, there is a relationship of uh, proximity to power and the fact that we were in a prestigious location, we were in prestigious offices, we not only had to go find people to come to the administration, but we had to attract them to the administration. And the setting there was an impressive setting that you were coming to something that was important and that you would be dealing with an office, in our case, that was an important office in the mix there. I think it was by design that that office was placed where it was and uh, had the prestige that it did. I'm going to quickly go through the basic process. 
in the first step in this, it was to do as wide a reach out as you could to get as many people as possible that could possibly serve in the administration. And of course, when President Nixon was elected and started his work on staffing his administration, that was publicized highly by the news media. Also, there was a effort made to draw people in by sending a letter to everybody who was in who's who. And this invited them, if they had an interest in serving in the administration, to have their credentials and make them known to us and also to recommend people that they thought might be good for the administration. So what was it like there? In those early days, yeah, there was an inundation of people from all walks of life that wanted to help be part of the Nixon administration. We strongly felt that we had an obligation that each person that said they wanted to help the Nixon administration or be part of it, that they should be responded to and recognized and thanked for their volunteering to do this. And so in the early going, we had to quickly make sure that these letters were all acknowledged and people felt that they were sincerely considered. How were they considered? Well, they were actually considered by once a resume received at that office, every single one of those was reviewed by a human being. There was a cover sheet put on that resume. They were divided by their various talent levels and rated as such, and also where their skills may be useful in the departments or agencies. Because you heard the figures, 550 positions, the top level, and then there were 2,500 additional positions, and all of those are what were classified as non-career positions, and those were where the people who were supposed to be implementing the policies of the elected president would be. So we were interested in people at all levels and, and, that, and this was how we got them. Now, concurrently, with what, when this was happening, there was being set up out in each department and agency a liaison group, uh, which would then receive resumes sent from the White House. <clears throat> and there was a cooperative effort where we were doing interviewing, they were doing interviewing, and then so that this, uh, so that I don't take too much time on this, there were a whole set of procedures, which I, I will call generally in the vetting process. That was a very serious effort, which included reference checks, which included the vetting by their, the state they came from. There was a, uh, we had people in every single state of the union that did vet, vetting for us. There were name checks done through the FBI, and there was an FBI person who worked with our office on a regular basis. And for the top positions, a full field investigation was done. So if you were joining the Nixon administration, uh, you were vetted very seriously. We also believe strongly in redundant uh, interviewing so that a person would come in and not only would maybe I interview them, but I would ask some of my colleagues to also interview them. We would also have them interviewed at the department that they were related to or the agency they would relate to. So people would have four or five or six interviews and there would be a consensus reached in them before they were moved along into the process of being hired. Uh, I felt that it was a, <clears throat> a, a, a thorough process and the redundancy of it uh, meant that uh, a lot of good people came out of this. So at the time we recommended somebody to be employed by the Nixon administration, it was our belief that at that point of all these hundreds of thousands of people who, who had applied, that we had reviewed that that was the best individual for that job at that time. Um, I want to take just a couple other minutes. So that was basically the process. Uh, I want to take a couple other minutes to mention <clears throat> presidential and departmental boards and commissions. These are a very important thing and a lot of, a lot of departments have staffs that uh, <clears throat> work for these uh, various boards and commissions and they produce a lot of substantive uh, recommendations uh, across the government. Well, we had, because of all of this outreach, we had a lot of people that didn't want to work full time necessarily, but did want to make contribution part time. And there was a very good system by which literally thousands of people that had worked for Nixon, maybe in the campaign, would have been campaign con contributors. There had been just talented people in the states that were recommended to us. We saw that they got on boards and commissions because we knew A, which each board and commission was, B, how many people were on that, C, when the vacancies were coming. 
So we worked hard to get a great participation of many Americans in this administration by having them on these boards and commissions. I want to mention <clears throat> one other thing which relates to what you'll be hearing from my colleagues here is there was a, I don't know whether this was one meeting or whether this was uh, multiple meetings, but as the president put that cabinet together, and perhaps he said this sometimes to the individual cabinet officer, but I do believe that there was one point he said this to all of them, where he said, you are the cabinet officer, and more or less indicated those were your shops out there, and you should get those shops filled and uh, do the recruiting and staff them. I, I was told that uh, after one of those meetings where the president had said that, that he, as he was walking out, uh, said, I, I think maybe I went too far there. <laughs> and, and that probably was true, because as Jeff has so, so well stated, there was generally, a, generally cabinet government, and it was more important in, to be in concert with what the president's wishes were, that this be a government where the policies are carried out by the, from what the elected official wants, and that there be, this be done in unison and in a cooperative basis. Since some of the cabinet officers <clears throat> had taken literally what was said and pretty much were moving along on the basis of cabinet government, uh, we received a signal, uh, I'm not sure who, how this came to our offices, but this is that we had to pull that back some because the, the administration was gonna be more effective if it operated under the policies that the president was promulgating as opposed to what maybe the cabinet officer was promulgating. And we did have a, a distinct effort where we met with the cabinet officer, we met with their chiefs of staff, we met with various people. And I remember the, uh, the statement was used at candy stores. Well, and it was kind of, these really are all Richard Nixon's candy stores out across this government not individual candy stores that are the cabinet officer's candy stores. Well, we used to get a few chuckles out of that, but actually the message was pretty clear. So we made a valiant effort uh, to pull this back, and I would say we had some success or we're moving in a good direction, but I certainly would not present that by having a few meetings and emphasizing this on a regular basis that we achieved a uh, complete victory in this. And as you'll see from the rest of the panel, they also pursued this, and they had some other methods by which they, uh, I think, got people's attention. Thank you, They're, Alan. Thank you. Okay, good. And that, that brings us to Fred, who's brought in in, uh, in 1970 to uh, eff help, effect help effectuate that change. Thank you, Jeff, and thanks for what you're doing uh, to make this series of forums happen. Uh, you mentioned some very, very important and, and impressive people who came out of those days in the Nixon administration. There are three you missed. Colin Powell, who was my executive assistant at OMP. Um, you missed John Huntsman, who I recruited in HEW, and then later the White House, John Huntsman Sr., uh, who signed with the presidential candidate and former governor. And of course, the gifted writer and columnist uh, since deceased Bill Sapphire. Um, When I uh, was recruited to come over to the White House, I had been a Deputy Undersecretary of Health, Education, and Welfare, which uh, doesn't currently exist. It's a combination of HHS and the Department of Education. I'd come out of a background of having been in business, Harvard Business School of Business, uh, and I understood organization. I understood uh, the value of professional recruiting. Didn't understand too much about politics, but uh, I think I was brought over because the president wanted to have a greater, uh, more structure in the office, a more organization in the office, and a broader outreach. Uh, I was just barely 10 years out of West Point. Um, probably would have helped if I had had a little more experience and actually knew what I was doing. Uh, but it was, a, it was a heady responsibility for a young man coming in at that, at that point in time. Uh, what I found is, was that they had done a really good job, I think, of organizing all of the inflow that had come in. They had appointed some very good people, but the difficulty was in getting people in across the board who really had the qualifications and fit the jobs well. And it was difficult to combat a uh, cabinet officer's selection who might have been subpar unless you had somebody better or a senator's or any political uh, organization's push for somebody unless you had somebody 
that was better. You can't beat something with nothing. Um, I kind of felt that the, the approach to recruiting was what we called bugata, a bunch of guys around the table. Uh, you would sit around a table and you would say, well, who do you know and who do you know? And it's common, a lot of companies do this too. And, and there was no formal way to reach out and, and, and go after the broader universe of people that were out there. Um, my thesis was that the very best people are probably not gonna contact you because they're gainfully employed, uh, climbing a very important ladder in their careers, and you gotta find them. And, and you gotta find them and persuade them to come in and lend their talents to government. So the, one of the very first things uh, that uh, I did was get approval to form an executive search unit, an executive recruiting team within the White House Personnel Office. Um, I went to several uh, leading search firms to ask their help in, in providing people on either a part-time or a full-time basis and succeeded in bringing on board three key recruiters. Uh, Penn James, who came from Hydric and Struggles, uh, was the head of the group. Uh, Bill Miramoto, I can't remember what firm he came from. He uh, came on board and later uh, led the effort on minority recruiting, and John Clark. I also had Dick Berry of Torrance Berry on on a temporary basis who helped, who helped to organize this all to get started. I think he was still there when Penn came on board and helped Penn get adjusted. Um, we then developed a system where we would go out, we would carefully specify the job requirements. We get agreement from the cabinet uh, officer on what the job requirement was, what kind of criteria we should try to fill. And then they, the recruiters would go out and span the country as a professional executive search executive does and find a, the best people they could find who were willing to come on board. Uh, the cabinet officer in the meantime might have his or her, well it was only his at that point, uh, own person to select and there might be political pressure from various sources from somebody else. <coughs> we would then develop for the president a series of options. One, here's, here is somebody who best fits the qualifications, who we really think is, is the, would do the best job. Here's the person the cabinet officer wants, sometimes they're the same one, hopefully. And three, here's the one with the greatest political support and, and where it's coming from. And out of these three, here's our recommendation. And it wouldn't always be one or the other, and sometimes they would be combined, but he would have that choice. <coughs> the president didn't put that much reliance on, as, as Al Coppin said, on the political. Our thesis, and I believe the president's thesis was, that loyalty and philosophy could be adopted and learned over time. We were doing the right things. We felt we were doing the right things. We felt we had the right policies. And anybody we brought in, if we weren't good enough to bring them on board and convince them of the righteousness of the directions we were going, then that was maybe our fault and not theirs. Because if we had recruited good people and brought them on board, they would, they would adapt and they would become loyal to the policies we espoused. I believed it firmly. When I was at HEW, three of my most valued colleagues were Democrats or one a very moderate Republican. Lou Butler, the Assistant Secretary for Policy, who was kind of my, my running mate uh, there, was a Democrat from San Francisco. Across the hall from me were two assistants to the Undersecretary. I was Deputy Undersecretary. One was named Tim Wirth. Tim later went on to be an elected Democrat senator from Colorado. The other one was Leon Panetta, who was a, Dem who was a Republican then. He was a moderate Republican from California. Uh, of course, he went on to become uh, uh, a congressman from California, chief of budget director, chief of staff, and now defense secretary. So my feeling was they were amongst my most valued colleagues. They performed well. Their whole dedication was to mission, and, and that's the way we would try to go. And the president, to his very, very great credit, um, agreed with that approach, in fact, espoused that approach, and that's the way we went about recruiting. We later dis determined at the president's direction that we needed to do a better job of outreach. We're getting a lot of the, you know, a lot of the same kind of people you see around in some of these positions, the uh, uh, white male Ivy League <laughs> folks like you, Jeff Shepard, lawyers <laughs> from I, Harvard Law School. I, I come from <laughs> California. I, I went to Whittier College. Forget that Harvard stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, needed, we, we, we needed more humble people from the sticks like myself. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, we developed an outreach program. The president particularly wanted to outreach to women. Um, and I was able to attract uh, Barbara Franklin, 
to that position. Uh, Barbara, I had known for many, many years. She's she's been executive at City uh, City Group or City Bank, I guess it was called then. And Barbara was a classmate of mine at West Point. At West Point. Excuse me. Wow. Barbara was not a West Pointer. <laughs> <laughs> this is this Barbara, is good, Fred. <laughs> Barbara was a classmate of mine at the Harvard Business School. Now, <laughs> I then reached far and wide to try to find other talented people, and as you can see. Uh, I used the Bogota approach because failing in finding really talented people, I resorted to those who I knew best, my <laughs> classmates from, from Harvard Business School, Barbara, and then later Jerry Jones, who, who, who performed remarkably in their positions, by the way. Uh, I then uh, asked Bill Miramoto to take on the job of recruiting more uh, on minorities, and we had a particular focus, of course, on, on African Americans and Hispanics, uh, and, and I think we made a meaningful difference, and Barbara, of course, will talk a little bit more about that. Um, I think we made a real. I think we made a real difference uh, in this. I think the result was a greater professionalism amongst the people we brought in. Um, we didn't always have full agreement from the cabinet, but it was an interactive process. Uh, I was the cabinet officer on the selection of people, and where there were differences, we'd sit down and we'd resolve them, and we'd come to an agreement. Uh, in some cases, the most qualified person wasn't selected because it was apparent that that person wouldn't wor work as well with the cabinet official. Uh, as long as that person met certain criteria, we were okay with that and the president was okay with that. But I think the result of the process is we got an awful lot more people involved in being considered for these positions and a lot more confidence into the executive positions that, that really make the machine of government work effectively. Thank you. Thank you, Fred. Barbara? <coughs> We have a slide for you. Oh, we have a slide. There we the, are. Uh, the first uh, photograph of women in women appointees in the Rose Garden, April 1972. Uh, there were more than that, but this was the group we could find. And I want to add to you, to uh, everyone's comments, Jeff, my thanks to what you're doing with these legacy forums. It's quite wonderful. And Jim, also to you and what the archives is doing. Well, I'm, w I'm always struck and listening to the president announce the 12 men <laughs> who are going to lead the government. Let me start by, by indicating what happened at his second press conference. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read this from this book, A Matter of Simple Justice by Lee Stout, which chronicles the whole effort to advance women, which was really quite considerable in the administration. Second press conference that the president had, Vera Glasser, who was uh, covering the White House for the North, Amer North American Newspaper Alliance, who was a very attractive, well-spoken woman, you, you knew her, I think, all of you probably did, stood up in this really almost all-male briefing room, where there's a photo in this book, and asked this question. Mr. President, in staffing your administration, you have so far made about 200 high-level cabinet and other policy position appointments. And of these, only three have gone to women. Can you tell us, sir, whether we can expect a more equitable recognition of women's abilities, or are we going to remain a lost sex? And I can just imagine the gasp that must have gone through that briefing room at the audacity of such a question. The president joked a little bit with her, but then he said, and again, we have this, and I'm going to quote it, he said, very seriously, I had not known that only three had gone to women, and I shall see that we correct that imbalance very promptly. Strong statement, I think, from the president right up front here. And that then triggered what I would term a circuitous uh, <laughs> set of events, one of the things that happened was the appointment of a president's task force on women's rights and responsibilities. And there was an internal fight. Charlie Clapp, whom you know, was the guy who did this working for Arthur Burns, was uh, a, a fight inside the White House about what kinds of people would be on this. And the progressives won. <laughs> Charlie pulled that off. And therefore, what came out of that, that report in late 1969, released in 1970, called A Matter of Simple Justice, uh, was a very progressive set of recommendations about what should be done for women, including more appointments and including uh, what ended up being my job. 
And then the next big thing that happened after Fred had come and reorganized the, the uh, personnel function, in the spring, April of 1971, there were three things that were done, pretty much in tandem, that set the stage for the advancement of women. The first was that the president sent a memorandum to his cabinet secretaries and agency heads saying he wanted an action plan about how they were going to appoint, advance, train women in their departments. And he had a due date. I want it back by May 15th, and I want you to tell me who in, is your point person in the department. And then at the end, there was a paragraph that said something like, I'm going to personally monitor the results here. Again, I think another strong statement. The second prong of, of this attack was Fred's uh, recruiting of me to come in to, in turn, recruit women for the top quality uh, or the top high, the policy making jobs in government. And also, to my office came the action plans, which were, quite frankly, a total mess mm -hmm. <laughs> because nobody had ever done that before. And so I spent considerable time working with, with the folks in the departments to get these action plans to, to actually make sense. And they, we, we did get there. And the third thing that was done in, in the three-pronged effort was to bring Jane Baker Spain in as commissioner of the old Civil Service Commission. And her role was to watch over women in the career service. And so it was the three-pronged effort. There were goals set up at the, at the outset. Uh, we were to double in a year the numbers of women in the policy making jobs, which would be GS 16 and above. We were to considerably advance the numbers of women in the middle management ranks, GS 13 to 15, and 25% of the positions in the, the commissions, you talked about uh, the commissions uh, uh, and the board, the, yeah, were to be women. Now, this was far-reaching, if you really think about uh, all of this. And then uh, I, I had to, um, for my part here, beat the bushes to find women. And we, had, uh, we didn't have a talent bank of women. I went to the business and professional women's clubs who, who, who did, they had started a talent bank. They were very helpful. But really, uh, you know, we didn't have Google and Facebook, so <laughs> we could find find people. So I literally had to divide the country into regions, 10 regions, and then reach out to each one. So I did some traveling and looked for sources who could help me bring some of the, the women to the forefront and then gather the documents about them and, and hand them over to some of the, the vetting, although by then I had some staff, thanks to Fred. We, we would be able to do some, some of the vetting ourselves. I have to emphasize one thing. Uh, we, we had to find women who, who really were qualified. And in fact, because women were under-titled, under-paid, under-recognized, they were really over-qualified. I think the ones that, that we found and brought into the process, we did not want anybody to fail. And, and really, I don't think anyone did. Uh, and I, I should also say that I was bringing the women in, but I had to depend on the, the guys <laughs> in the liaison part of the shop to, to place them. So we, I had to get kind of clever about where the vacancies were going to be, and I had to get the, the help of, of some of these folks. And there was one member of your liaison staff, I'm thinking of Stan Anderson, who's not here, who used to get really mad at me. And he, we'd be on this intercom, and he would say, enough of this, and he'd hang up on me. <laughs> and I had to go and, uh, you know, try to schmooze a little and say, well, we really do have to do this. Anyway. Um, and the president wanted it, and we did monitor. One of the things that made this work was that we were monitoring how the departments and agencies were doing. They had targets, too. There were numbers in here. They were not quotas, they were targets. And I think the managerial part of, of this was, is in, in large measure what made this successful. And then if we, we go to where, when this photograph was taken in April of, of 72, what, what had been accomplished in that year we had not just doubled the numbers of women in the policy-making jobs, we had tripled it. And I want to say a lot of people helped in this, really did, including some of those who I had to fight with. <laughs> but a lot of people did in government and, and uh, out. 
And so that was accomplished. And the, the key thing, though, was that many of them were in jobs that women had never held, more than half of them. So that you, you had the breakthroughs. Marina Whitman became, uh, was the first woman in the Council of Economic Advisors. Uh, Cynthia Hall, the first woman on the tax court. Dixie Lee Ray, the first woman on the old Atomic Energy Commission. And that kind of, of litany. And then in the GS 13 to 15 category, a 1,000 women were moved up at a time when the federal government was shrinking by 5%. And those two, uh, many of those were non-traditional jobs. Tugboat captains, forest rangers, secret service agents, uh, narcotics agents. Again, uh, proving that a woman could do such a job. And I, I think we also have to say that there was not consensus in our society then that women should be doing some of these things. There was not. Or the women had careers, could have careers and families. Uh, that's changed now, but that's the way it, that's the way it was. And then in terms of the boards and commissions, there was a very good record there. So it was a, uh, it was a, a great, uh, great start. And then once the, the genie was out of the bottle, by the time we got to the second year, the, the numbers had, had gone up uh, uh, even further. Fantastic, fantastic. And you can tell Barbara was a formidable force in causing that. We go to <laughs> Jerry. Jerry came on a little bit later and uh, had the fun of evaluation and replacement. The, uh, Three of us, Al, Fred, and I, were at the campaign in 1972. We began at different times. But we came back from the campaign just after the election. And the president had made a, 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 a really unusual decision that, that I don't know in modern times if it's ever been done uh, before that, and I, I think certainly it's not been done since. He asked each presidentially appointed person who typically have been confirmed by the Senate, I think there are two or three presidential appointees that are not, to please submit their resignations. And uh, the, the, so here were 555 presidentially appointed people who submitted resignations at the, uh, after the election was won. And it was a, a, a bizarre, really, in the, in the sense that uh, it was a total new start. He basically said, I want to be sure that we use the time in the second administration effectively and that we have fresh, effective people in these positions. Uh, it, 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 he used the term, unfortunate term, spent volcano. Uh, we, we want to be rid of the spent volcanoes. And so the, here, <laughs> this personnel function was presented with the president's view of what he now wanted to do, having won the second term, uh, uh, of, of, about re-energizing and renewing what he was trying to do as a program. And uh, it, this was the way he chose to do it. This team, there were six of us, as I recall, who, under Fred's leadership at the time, uh, Fred ran the personnel office from after the election when we arrived until early January, so that two-month period. And in that two-month period, we were asked to, to recommend to the president whose resignations he should accept. And so the six of us uh, had that, frankly, fairly terrible task to look through the 555 people that were in these positions currently and make a judgment and make a series of recommendations to the president on what he should consider doing. The, let me add one other thing. In the beginning, as Al said, the president had told the cabinet officers, you may name your people, uh, essentially is what he said. That we spent the entire first term <laughs> trying to pull that back. And Fred, Fred did a great job. Al, pulling it back, 
working with the cabinet officers, getting agreement, getting consensus, making recommendations, and so on. But the president had begun to feel that he really must have his people out there. I, I know Fred said that, that uh, uh, he was okay with the cabinet officers having their own people and so on, but what, I, what we found as, as he began to construct a new concept of the presidency, which is a centralized presidency directing policy out into the departments and agencies, that he needed a, a much more co cohesive team than, than we had found. And I'll get to that in a second, but he decided that he wanted, absolutely wanted, the most competent people he could get, but also team players. And so our job was to find those people who, let me back up a second, Unfortunately, working in the executive branch of the federal government is not like anything most anyone else, most people have ever done before. And so you do a, the best job you can do, recruiting, background checks, uh, great credentials of people, and they come, and they get confirmed, and they go to their departments. And unfortunately, even though we have the highest expectation for all of these people to be successful, they're not. Many are woefully unsuccessful, at least in terms of driving change that the president wanted. And it's almost impossible to predict beforehand who's going to be super and who isn't. And some people that you think are going to be uh, superior performers aren't. Some people that you uh, don't necessarily expect that sort of performance for become stars. And the, the, the job then, as we began the second term, was to try to sort through who had done well, who had been team players, who had been successful, and those who had not been, who had been disappointments. And those are hard judgments to make. Uh, no one wants to make judgments like that. Uh, but the present, you, you have eight years. You have four-year terms. That is a flash. It very often takes people almost the first year after they're, they're uh, 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 found to be confirmed, to have an office, to know what their job is, and to begin. Uh, a, a presidential term goes by in a flash, and unless you're absolutely uh, determined to use that time well, it gets frittered away. Uh, eight years frittered away is an incredible waste for the, for the American people, uh, for the world, really, in, given our position. And so we had the job of trying to renew the administration and uh, re-energize it for the second term, we had to make very hard choices. I'll give you numbers. Uh, 555 presidentially appointed people. At the end of that two-month period of evaluations, 350 of those jobs were open. Now, not all of them were asked to leave. Many people left on their own accord. Many, another tidbit of information. Many of these jobs at the highest level turn over very rapidly. I think the average, uh, the average tenure in a in a senior position in the government is about two years, eighteen, 18 months, months for a confirmed position. Uh, eighteen months. Eighteen months, very rapid turnover. Now people aren't coming and necessarily leaving immediately. They get promoted. They get sent to another agency. They a, a new a new position has to be created and they go there. But it's very rapid turnover, and uh, 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 the, so the 350 positions weren't necessarily all terminations, but many of them were. Um, and that was done in two months, the beginning of January before the inauguration, 350 open positions. Fred then 
<laughs> says, adios. He goes and, and it's a big deal at OMB. Uh, and uh, leaves me uh, <laughs> holding a great big bag with help from Barbara and others, uh, trying to fill 350 jobs uh, uh, in a second administration uh, where there, had, uh, there were clouds on the horizon. And so off we go. Off we go. Uh, and the incredible thing is, in this country, uh, the, the, we had, Jeff didn't mention it, but when you, when you think about the circumstance that we were dealing with, we had a Cold War with the Soviets, we had a hot war in Vietnam that we were trying to extricate ourselves from that was not going well. Can you imagine, let's see, what, 4,000 casualties in Iraq, 50,000 KIAs in Vietnam, incredible pressure on the president, uh, a, a very ambitious domestic program he was trying to do, and then all of the other things coming from the campaign. People, nonetheless, in this country wanted to come serve and help this administration be successful. And uh, I, I, I'm very proud to tell you, picking the, I only had one direction that was somewhat different from, from the one that Fred outlined to you uh, uh, earlier. Uh, President Nixon had spent uh, the entire campaign essentially recruiting the blue collar workers of this okay. country to become the new majority uh, to support uh, a Republican administration. And we were successful, wildly successful in doing that. And the only instruction other than the one that Fred had uh, on what the president wanted to do was that he really seriously wanted to try to bring people from the US labor movement into this administration. And so we had to widen the aperture on, on what we were looking at for recruiting to include uh, that segment of the U.S. population and to try to bring people from the labor movement into the administration. And I will tell you, it was difficult. Uh, uh, the background of many labor people uh, uh, is simply not what is required in, in the senior level uh, political positions in, in the administration. It, they just unfortunately aren't. So we had to struggle with that, but we did our very best. Other than that, uh, okay. the, the, the guidance was the same. The best people you can find, taking uh, notice that we need more women, taking notice that we need more minorities, but being darn sure that you have the labor movement represented. And I had a friend right around the corner named Chuck Colson who came by <laughs> several times a week to chat with me about the, the progress we were making Helpful chat. On, labor, on, on labor appointments. And, uh, uh, and Chuck was a very forceful man and, <laughs> and, and quite determined on this. So uh, we were able to fill those 350 positions. I left to become staff secretary under Al Haig after uh, 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 the changeover at chief of staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think we had a, a normally in the personnel office a float of 10 or 15 or 20 positions open at any one time. I think there were 10 jobs open when I went to become sec staff secretary out of the 350. So we had 340 of them filled. And I think with, with exceptional patriotic people who, who really uh, wanted to support the president. Thank you, Jerry. And that brings us to our, uh, our cleanup hitter, Penn James, who's going to uh, tell us all the lessons learned in their later application. Well, it was an interesting time, the Nixon years, and I think we who served in the Reagan years uh, learned a lot. And I have to give some accolades to Fred Malik, who is the one that, we use the term professionalized uh, 
Office of Presidential Personnel. It was really through Fred and his working with Haldeman and the President to get that done. One thing that we did learn in the Reagan years, and I don't want to belabor Reagan because we're here to talk about Nixon, <coughs> is that we learned very quickly that Richard Nixon made his first mistake, as was alluded here. His first cabinet officer meeting in the cabinet said to President Nixon, we can pick our own people, right? And he said, yes, you can pick your own people. And as he walked out of the room, and this is all documented, he turned to an aide and said, I just made my first mistake. He gave away the appointment process. What we learned in the Reagan years is not to repeat the mistake but to control the appointment process, emphasis on control. Because if you want to control policy, you've got to control appointments. If you don't control appointments, you don't control policy. Absolutely. So Reagan coming off of eight years as a governor, running an executive branch, realized that he wanted to make sure that should he get elected, we would be able to put together a team, unlike, again, Mr. Nixon and uh, Peter Flanagan, he gets elected the next day, he says, well, where are we going to put our transition office, uh, give us office space, how are we going to put together a team? I started with Governor Reagan seven months before he was ever elected president at his direction to work covertly because it was unseemly to look like he could put together his team to say, if I got elected, Penn, I want a plan is how would we go about putting together our team? Uh, I worked, and it was just one man, it was just me. And so I, I went around and talked to various people in the next years and other administrations and put together a, a seven pages, it wasn't a big document about how would we go about controlling the appointments. And then as it got closer to the election, it looked like Reagan was going to be the president elect. And then we, my work got a little bit more serious. <clears throat> I worked closely with Cap Weinberger and William French Smith and some of the other senior members of the circle. And one way we controlled it is I was, my title was an assistant to the president, which is the highest rank you can have. My office was in the West Wing. And going back to Al, proximity is important. Uh, Every day, I met with Baker Deaver Meese at 5 o'clock at the end of the day, every day, and myself and nobody else was ever in that room or invited to that meeting, where we went over the final candidates who would be presented to approval by the president. I'm going to keep going back to control. How do we control the process? Um, when each cabinet officer going again, talking about Reagan, was appointed the Secretary of Treasury, for example, Don Regan. I sat in the Oval Office when President-elect asked Don Regan to be Secretary of Treasury, and he said, now, Don, before you accept this appointment, I want you to know that I am going to control the appointments, and Penn James here is going to handle the appointments. That doesn't mean we don't want your input. doesn't mean we don't, aren't going to listen to your ideas. But we're going to have centered here in the White House via presidential personnel, which I had. And so the, each cabinet officer, as he came on board, realized the first day that we were going to control the appointment. That was our control. And, uh, and unlike Fred, he had a staff of five, six, seven people to do this job. I had a staff of 40 people. I had a huge staff. Over the, now, at, after the first six months, that staff went down to, I think, like 15. But at the beginning, because of the sheer numbers you're talking about, no one person can manage that process. So you have to delegate various authorities under the presidential personnel to focus on economic policy, national security policy, agricultural policy, or whatever it may be, and put the team together. So one thing we learned was control the appointment process. Now, admittedly, as time goes on, after two years, 
no matter how strong you are, presidential personnel, the cabinet officers become more and more authority and power of, or control of the White House diminishes just by time and experience. Uh, going back to what Fred was trying to accomplish to professionalize uh, the appointment process, I'd like to give three examples of, of the recruitment process under Fred and uh, Richard Nixon. For an example, Paul Volcker was the Undersecretary for International Monetary Affairs. His deputy was Bruce McClory. Fred said, Bruce McClory is leaving the deputy. Go over and see Paul and find out what we can do to help him find the new deputy. So I go trotting over to see Paul Volcker and said, we want to help you on that. And what size you want to hold. So I go back to my office in typical headhunter fashion you start sourcing leaders within that given professional field. Like, for example, I called Walter Riston, the City Corp, Gaylord Freeman in Chicago, uh, Tom Clausen at B of A, and whatever, and gave ideas and on and on. So I came up with a series of candidates, because my job was not to look on the political side, but only on the substantive side, unless it were raving Democrats, obviously. Common sense takes place. Uh, we didn't fill that position. Uh, Jack Hennessy was moved up and became the deputy to Paul Volcker, as you may recall. But during those sourcing calls, one name kept coming up by the name of Bill Simon, who was a bond trader in uh, Solomon Brothers in New York. And so as we went on on appointments in the financial arena, I'd call this guy Bill Simon, because, you know, I never met him. You know, occasionally you get somebody on the phone, you ask him a question, He's, he's right there with you. He's immediately on your target and very helpful. So as time went on, I kept saying, we ought to know this guy, Bill Simon. And to make a long story short, uh, we had a position open and I briefed Fred and Fred briefed Paul Alderman, and we wrote a memo to the president recommending Bill Simon, who all, you know, became Secretary of Treasury later on. But what is interesting about that story, because I... The memo is a one-page memo. Most all memos to the president, I, in my world, is one page. It came back from the president with a line drawn through the whole letter and no exclamation mark, East Coast establishment, other options. And remember, Richard Nixon had a knee-jerk reaction against East Coast liberal establishment. And since he was Wall Street, obviously he's... Well, we overcame that, and he got the appointment. Particularly but, Ivy Leaguers. Uh, especially Particularly Ivy, Ivy Leaguers. Well, he was a Lafayette College. <laughs> yeah. uh, sure. But that showed some of the bias that he would have, because he was biased against East Coast establishment. I think that diminished. But that, then Bill went on. So that was an example of a headhunter-type identification. Oh, and an interesting thing, when Nixon said no on this guy, I called Bill, and Bill said, Penn, if you ever need political help, on me, let me know. And I called him. I said, Bill, you just got turned down. I need all the help you can. And I guess he got on the phone and called George Schultz and all of his buddies that he didn't know, and he got the appointment. The other one, typical, which really blew my mind, one time Haldeman had told Malik, the Secretary of Agriculture has submitted his resignation, uh, Cliff Harden. And so the president wants candidates to fill the Secretary of Agriculture. Fred turns to me and said, Penn, who do you got? Come up with Canada. I said, I can't believe the President of the United States, he only got 12 cabinet officers. He wouldn't know which one he wanted without turning me, who didn't even know where the Agriculture Department was. So I closeted myself in the office, asked for all the farm journals for the last five years, go through reading reports, who's who in agriculture, who gives speeches, who gets rewards, who gets water, go on on. Finally, come back with a list of about 20 odd names, just on a yellow pad. But my, my instructions were not to talk to him. In other words, he took away the best tool a recruiter has is his network of sources to get ideas. So I could not talk to him. It was purely an academic friendship. So I go back to Malik and said, Fred, this is all I can do unless I can talk to somebody and source and who He said, let me check it. Comes back to me and said, You can talk to Bryce Harville. President Clinton talked to Bryce Harville. 
morning, folks. I called Bryce Harlow, Bryce Gonzor, and I'll make this story short. Bryce was right down the list. He says, this one. And who, who went in the secretary here after Harden? Earl Butts. Butts. Earl Butts. Butts. He said, Earl Butts, yeah. Indiana. And that filled that job. Yeah. The other one I will mention to give you an idea of recruitment at the White House, so I won't, is we had two vacancies on the Federal Board, Fed, Federal Reserve Board of Governors. And remember, Arthur Burns was chairman of the Fed. But evidently, Nixon didn't want Burns to make the appointments or selection. So again, Malik turns to the recruiting side of his shop says, come up with candidates for the Federal Reserve Board. And I said, my God, can't you? Why do you have to turn to somebody like me to fill these, come up with candidates? I'm not a political animal. But anyhow, we did, and we filled two of those, and they were appointments that came through our shop, and not through the Fed. So the, the some point of that is that if you're going to control it, you've got to have the president's authority and his backing and what we learned from Mr. Nixon, Mr. Reagan learned, is I want that guy in the White House, and I want him on my uh, reporting directly to me. Uh, and I met with the president every twice a week on a regular schedule, three thirty in the afternoon on a Tuesday for Thursday. So I was always on his agenda, so I could talk to him uh, about the appointments and not let that slip. Uh, so what we try to do is re replicate what Nixon tried desperately to do, but well, he lost a, control it, quickly. It, it, it's a time. There's there, the changes in communication, changes in government, uh, uh, because of the media and because of the the, uh, the the pressures going on, where cabinet government used to work, and the Secretary of Labor could do what he wanted to do, and and it really didn't matter. Mm -hmm. But uh, the government gets more complex, and the problems get more complex. What's what's being done in labor? is going to impact HEW and going to impact another, another department. And, and when, when we're talking about teamwork, you've got to, you got to work with, with, with personnel. Uh, and, and it's got to be an integrated whole, and, you, and you've got to have a team. We're going to go around in a minute and, and, and do a little discussion, but because it's such a small world and, and we're here, uh, I, when I was a White House fellow, I was a White House fellow at Treasury for Paul Volcker. So I, I remember, and, and, and Bruce, that quite well. And at one point, I was staffing Bryce Harlow. And, and Bryce was one of the quietest, savviest guys you could possibly imagine. And agriculture came up. And he said to me, you know what's so interesting about agriculture is we're taking away benefits for the farmers. We're changing from an agrarian economy. And, and what I've learned is the president had better have a really good grip on his next Secretary of Agriculture before he lets go of the one he's got because it's a very hard position to fill because you're taking away benefits, not unlike being Secretary of Defense when the budget's being cut. You know, that, that's not the most fun thing in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's interesting. But I, what I'd like to do, go back in the panel, uh, got, got some questions, one of which is, uh, Jerry alluded to it, what's so different? about being in government than being in academia or being a business leader or, or being a labor leader, what's, what's unique about the executive branch? I wrote an article, uh, Mr. Executive Goes to Washington. I, I, it appeared in the Harvard Business Review, and since I've written so few articles, I remember that the Wall Street Journal actually did a favorable editorial at it. Um, and it talked about some of the differences. I think a political appointment at the top levels of government is far more complex, far more demanding, um, many, more, many more avenues of approach, many more issues to deal with than you would in business. In business, you have a chief executive has a board of directors and a defined sphere of, of impact. Uh, that person has to develop market share for, for his or her product has to improve profitability, but it's in a narrow field. These appointments in government are much broader. They have much further reaching impact, and you're answerable not to a board of directors, but to a president and to 500 or so members of Congress. And everything you do is being looked at through a magnifying glass, 
with the help of the, of the press corps, so that the public really can see what you're doing and sometimes knows what you, what you are contemplating doing even before you've decided to do it, which makes it all the more difficult to bring people together and, and make decisions. So you've got the complexities of, of, of the public, the press, the Congress, dealing with the White House and getting support there, as well as the very complexity of the issues you're dealing with. So I think the commonalities are that, that make for success are interpersonal skills, number one. You have to be able to work with people. You have to be, have a certain degree of empathy. You have to know where someone else is coming from. Uh, you have to have an executive capacity, an organizational capacity, um, because in any, in leading any organization, I think requires that. And above and beyond everything else, I think it's leadership. I think you gotta be a better leader in government than you do in business. A business person can get by without being a really good leader. I think a top government official needs to be a really good leader in addition to a good manager and having good interpersonal skills. Let me add to that, because this ad, Fred is right, and I still have your article in my archives. People say, well, we want the brightest people in government, the smart. I said, smart doesn't count in moving policy. If you don't have two things, if you don't have clout and access, if you don't have the clout to come and listen to you and access to get a point, you're just a smart guy sitting in your office. And that ties in with your... Well, and leadership, uh, to pick that point up, you do have in, in departments a bureaucratic group. And the bureaucracy, this is true anywhere, can really gum up policy or just wait it out, or just bureaucratic inertia, or whatever. So you really want people in these top positions who have the inspirational uh, skills as well, the leadership skills besides uh, what you were talking about, Fred, the ability to organize yeah. and whatever. I think that becomes more important because you want the career people to be with you. And I believe that is possible, but it takes some work sometimes. That's a really, really good point. A lot of people come in and think, well, the career people are here to, to stand in our way. We gotta, we gotta yeah. go around and we gotta, you know, they're not gonna help. It's not, it's not the right way to do it. The career people are there because they believe in the mission of their departments or agencies. That's right. That's why they're there. Um, if you can't convince them that you're taking them in the right direction, maybe there's something wrong with your leadership. Well, uh, I think to your yeah. point, and I, I'll get to Jerry in just a second with my next question. You're, you're uh, trying to lead them in a new direction. And you're, you're, you're changing things. And what, what happens, uh, and, and Jerry alluded to the fact that some really top people don't, don't quite work out. Uh, we have a phrase called going native, where you, you get appointed and you're well, confirmed and you're sitting over there. And if, if you aren't eager to change, the position will carry itself. The bureaucracy will keep going in the direction it's been going. And you get people, qualified people, who go along, accept that. And then how do you, how do you distinguish one, one, one from the other? Two th there are two things that I think are important here. Uh, I'll give one example. Uh, we were recruiting for the Assistant Secretary for Health Affairs at the Department of Defense during uh, Rumsfeld's time. Uh, and, and so the, the issue is what kind of person can do this job? Well, the answer is probably nobody. Uh, the, the job oversees $53 billion a year of expenditures. Nobody in the private sector has ever <laughs> had to deal with $53 billion a year of expenditures in healthcare. I mean, it, it's a mind-boggling change in terms of dimension that these guys are expected to do. So who out there has the experience to be able to do that? Uh, very hard job to fill. We filled it the first time with an insurance exec agent, uh, insurance company executive, the second time with a cardiologist. Frankly, the cardiologist did a better job than the insurance guy did. Uh, uh, <laughs> leave, leave that aside. The second thing is, and, and a huge difference between the any other organization, uh, mainly business ones, but also others, is that Washington is an adversarial environment. Uh, people come here 
not out of adversarial environments. Their companies are friendly, people get along, no, they know they're friends with everyone. Here, it's uh, adversarial, uh, and particularly with the Nixon administration, the Congress was controlled by the Democrats, and many of them didn't like Nixon at all. In fact, they really didn't like him at all. And they, they uh, asserted their authority in a, usually and very often uh, pretty contentious ways. It was not easy. Uh, so many leaders are not used to having to grapple with, with, with daily adversarial skirmishes. I, I'm reminded of the very unfortunate suicide note uh, that Vince Foster left. That this is a city that ruins people just for sport. Right, yeah. yeah. Uh, and and it, it, it is. You, it, everything seems fine. You're doing a fine job. And one misstep in the minuet, and all of a sudden, there, there are grand juries, or there are, uh, uh, you, you, you discover your, your driver uh, has been taking notes on, on where you've been driven, and, and, and you, become, you, find, you start reading about yourself in the paper, and, and the news people are camping on your doorstep. The, the thing that, that I began to try to do on all of the interviews as we began to staff the second term was to try to determine if the candidate had what I called a political personality. Now, I know that's a sort of a fuzzy term, but what I mean by that is someone who, who sort of understands the political world here and can negotiate it. And if you, one of the things uh, that happens with business guys is they come down here and they don't have any sense of how the political stuff sort of weaves in and out and how to play it. And if you are tone deaf politically, you're, you're a dead man walking uh, uh, here. And so it's a very hard skill to try to evaluate as a yes. personnel person. How, you know, how do you figure out whether somebody has that sort of that knack or not? Uh, but mm -hmm. to the extent that you can figure it out, you have a much better chance of finding a successful person here than if, if, you, if you don't. Fred? Well, Following up on, on that point and also uh, the, uh, the career point, I think you're right about that and I think our experience, I don't know if you guys would agree, has been that if somebody had varied experiences in business, um, they would be better able to adopt. Somebody had come up a single route mm -hmm. in, in, in one company, didn't quite have that adoptability and that mm -hmm. ability to sense the, the, the political relationships that need, need to be developed and how to work with the Congress and work with the White House and get the clout. You, so almost, you almost had to lose once or twice, or you know, uh, have, have, have a failure, because you learn more from a failure than a constant path of success. Probably true, although Unfortunately. I think if you, had, <laughs> I if you had a number of successful experiences in different fields, you could do it. The career, the career thing, is, is, it can't be overemphasized. I learned a lot uh, when I was deputy undersecretary from Elliot Richardson, mm -hmm. who became secretary. Mm -hmm. I would meet with him you know, two, three times a week on different things we were doing. And, or, organization or, or, or otherwise. And every time uh, he would ask me to bring a team of people who were in the agency working. For example, if we were doing something in the Social Security Administration, Bob Ball, the commissioner, and three or four of his associate commissioners would be in that meeting. And they would hear the reasoning and hear the secretary expounding on things. And, and over time, they are, they are part of the solution, they, and they better understand what you're trying to do, and they understand the fundamental decency you're, that you're not being driven just by political, uh, by political mm -hmm. motivation or mm -hmm. by a ter certain philosophy. You're trying to do the right thing and the reason behind it, and mm -hmm. that's how you win them over. And, and it's, it can be done. I was a cabinet officer who, who did just that, bring uh, career people into some of the issue task forces we mm -hmm. had, and you're quite right. It, it, then they buy in, we become part of the team. But you know, it, it takes uh, some understanding that you have to do that. I don't know how you train people who don't have the understanding that you do. And, and then you, you have to do it if you're sitting in any of these top yeah. jobs, whether it's cabinet or, 
or, uh, or, or below. And I agree with Jerry. I think it's a really hard skill, uh, that this political uh, thing, which is really part of the career thing, too, the bringing those people in. That's really hard to evaluate. Let, let me try on that one. Penn has talked about it, and I, I, I think Fred commented. But one of the things, particularly on the higher level positions, and to, to talk a second about the young people, one of the things that the president wanted to do was to grow a generation of young uh, uh, executive branch leaders. And so we were all very young. I was 32 when we started. You were 33. So we were and 24. The kid. <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, we, well, see, I was kind of his classmate. We, we both went to Whittier. So. <laughs> but, but we put in place a, a whole group of young people who got executive branch experience of, of uh, many dozens, many dozens. The, the key, though, and, and going back to this Earl Butts choice, at the higher level jobs, if the person hasn't had experience in Washington or very close experience, like being a, an executive in a, 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 a firm that works very closely with the government, like I, I, we recruited a Secretary of Navy out of uh, what had been TRW, uh, uh, who had worked for 30 years contracting with the Defense Department. But if, mm -hmm. if <laughs> for the senior positions, you really need someone who's been here before, maybe two or three times before. Now, Republicans tend to come and then they tend to go out in the private sector. Mm -hmm. Uh, so they can they can loop through several times, but the Earl Butts example is a great one. He may have been the best cabinet officer that I knew, in terms of being truly in control of that area uh, uh, that he was <laughs> responsible for. And this guy had been here as an assistant secretary for international marketing or something. Fred, do you remember? I don't remember. But he, but he had been an assistant secretary before in the Eisenhower administration. That's why Bryce knew him. Mm -hmm. And so this guy absolutely felt this town. He felt the vibrations. I remember riding back from a meeting over at the department with him, and we were going through the issues that he was facing in the ag department. And he was saying, this is how I'm going to play this. If they ask me this, I'm going to say this. I could say this, or I could say, I'm going to say this. I'm going to play it this way. This does this. These three constituencies like that. We, uh, th 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 this will smooth over the senator that's about to kill me, and so on. The guy thought politically. He thought about how the town worked and how he would have to respond to all of these hypothetical type things that he, he was going to get hit with that day. I think I was bringing him over for some sort of a press availability. And uh, he was absolutely on top of it, and he couldn't possibly have done that if he hadn't have hadn't been known the town and been here before, yeah. I think four years under Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. And so he was a natural. Now, not everybody that has been here before is right, a natural, but, but this guy was a natural. But well, let me do this, let me do this, because we're the hour grows, grows long. Uh, uh, the, the, question, the final question on the exam for our panel <laughs> is what, for each of you, what do you think is the most important thing you learned uh, uh, in the Nixon administration in doing personnel and if you were to advise a newly elected president on personnel, what would your advice be? And they could key off the same thing, but l let me begin with my friend Alan and <clears throat> go through that. Well, actually, one of the things that I found most pleasing about what's happened here today is when I heard uh, Ken James explain how he worked with the Reagan administration. And what they did was they started early you did it quietly. And he also, you know, we put the surge into Iraq and that turned the Iraq situation around. And really your surge in personnel should be the first day you're in there full time to start staffing those jobs and he had a staff of 40 people. So, because my, my recommendation would have been to somebody to do <clears throat> what you uh, exactly did with President Reagan. Uh, because the problems are you don't start early enough, 
and you don't have enough people to execute at the time. That's and control it. And control it. Always control. Because everybody's trying to take that power away from you. Well, the president's the only nationally elected everybody, leader. Everybody. I mean, everybody else has ideas, but he's, he's just come off an election, mm -hmm. and he's, got, he's done the balancing yeah. in getting elected, he or she. Fred? When I came in uh, with a business background primarily, um, I put a great deal of emphasis on the business, traditional business skills of organization and so forth. Uh, I think what I came out with was a much greater appreciation for the what we've been talking about, some of the political skills that, that need to be melded with that, because without those, you cannot be successful. And I think that uh, a blend of the two, the organizational experience of a successful business person uh, combined with the political skills one gets from entering and conquering uh, different challenges in different industries and different sectors would, would lead to the ideal person, particularly one that's, that's been here before. However, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to get people from business who have had that repetitive experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Because once that career is interrupted in the age of specialization that we are in, it's much more difficult to resume that career and be as successful and not be left behind by your peers who are, who are continuing to pursue their endeavors. Hard, hard to go home when you've become an expert in an aspect of government if what you That's did right. before isn't as a government contractor. Yeah. It's not value. So therefore, you have a lot of government contractors. You've got, you got a preponderance now, I think, reliance on uh, academia, legal profession, perhaps government contractors, as opposed to people that come from other sectors of the mm -hmm. private sector, mm -hmm. other sectors of industry. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Barbara? Add, add to that, Fred, uh, the, the golden handcuffs. And these guys yeah. can't yeah. leave in mid-career. Yeah. What we found we had to do over at DOD this last time through is begin to re uh, rely on a lot of guys that were ready to retire, you know, they were 60, 62, mm -hmm. still mm -hmm. with a lot of energy, mm -hmm. who yeah. wouldn't have a job after they left there uh, because we couldn't get them out of organizations uh, in mid-career. I think, yeah. you know, and our, like when we were doing this, I think we were, if we wanted somebody, we could get them. Right. 75% of the people we wanted accepted. Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, an, it was an honor to come and there wasn't, yeah. the, there wasn't the vicious punishment. That, that there is now. Yeah. Barbara? And for women, it was more risky to come, to your point, yeah. because they were afraid they couldn't get back mm -hmm. to wherever they'd mm -hmm. come mm -hmm. from. Anyway, that's not my biggest learning. <laughs> my biggest learning out of that experience um, is that presidential leadership uh, really made a difference. As we said, there was not consensus in our society about what women should and should not do. And in fact, when, when Fred first called me about coming, I was, I was advised by friends not to do it. You were skeptical. Don't do it, they said, because that administration will never do anything mm -hmm. for women. Well, I <laughs> you were persuasive. So I decided, decided um, to do it, but in a way that was a risk as well. In, in any case, because of where society was about women and careers and families and whether we should be doing both, uh, what it needed presidential leadership. It needed the support, however, of Fred, of people sitting here, and of, of Bob Finch, who was very important mm -hmm. in this process, who was a counselor to the president. But it needed presidential leadership, backed by the management effort around it that monitored and watched tar uh, targets and watched progress uh, to make it work. But it needed presidential leadership, or I don't think it would have. There was too much dissension in the mix, even in that White House. And in hindsight, I think what that president did by making a visible effort to advance women, he pulled this noisy drumbeat left-leaning movement for women's equality right into the middle of American life. He made it legitimate. He made it okay. He made equality for, for women a uh, part, of, part of our life. That was profound, yeah. I believe. Hmm. Hmm. Jerry? The, the thing that's impressive when you begin to really look at these government positions is how incredibly difficult they are to do well. Uh, there is simply no question that it's a, a, a world-class challenge to do well. Uh, and th it is very hard to find people who can do them exceedingly well. As the president said, I want superb people. 
Um, the, the unfortunate downside is that once you put people in place, it is very hard to replace them in a, in a, a, a political environment like this. Uh, and the, so hard that you leave poor performers in pl places where they shouldn't be long after you know they're not performing well. And uh, the, that's a learning thing. And I praise President Nixon for saying, we are not going to have that. I am going to change. Uh, and I know it's going to break China. But we must change if we are going to take advantage of, of, of the opportunity here to govern this country. And so I think the, the thing that I learned was how, how demanding the jobs are, how hard they are to do, and then how hard it is to correct a mistake. And I, I praise the president for being willing to do that. Uh, Fair it's enough. hard. Pam? There's a report that was done by former President Jerry Ford and former President Jimmy Carter that was sponsored by the Brookings Foundation some years ago after they had left office. And it was your question. Uh, the, there were a series of questions, but the first question to former uh, Ford and Carter, what advice would you give to the next president, which was going to be George Bush 41, but was before Bush? And they said, both of them said, loyalty, 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 three times, direct quote. In other words, you have run for office on a political platform of what you want to accomplish, what you believe the direction of the government should be in, what the policies we're trying to change or modify or grow. And the only way you can do that, Mr. President, is to assure yourself that the men and women that you appoint and you bring in understand and are loyal. By loyalty, we don't mean sycophants. We don't mean, you know, uh, hanger honors, but who really understand what you as a president are trying to accomplish in the Department of Agriculture or Defense or whatever it may be, or foreign policy, that it is your policy that you have run on, that you have espoused during the one year campaign, and that the men and women you're bringing in are committed to help you to achieve that goal. That is what has to be done for any president. Otherwise, it, his administration will flounder off. And it's substantive loyalty, not political loyalty. Well, there's it's, a, a, a dash, substantive okay. dash. Loyalty. Okay. Because you're not going to point somebody who's opposed to your political philosophy. Hopefully not. Oh, well, I'll, the, you this has been a wonderful forum. Uh, this is the, our, our 22nd forum, and, and like the others, uh, a fantastic group of people, different points of view, insights into what's going on. The, the intriguing thing about Richard Nixon, he'd been on the national scene for so long. There was so much he wanted to do. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't preside, he, he led. And, and he, he wanted, and that's what these people's job was, to bring people in to help, help bring about change. And, and, and we know from the other forums, a tremendous amount of change occurred. We know from this forum how many of those people got here. I thank you for coming. I hope you come join us for another forum in the future. Good day. Thank you.